Today is the 16th of May, 2022, and yesterday was the commemoration of an important day in the Buddha Sasana, the day that the founder of Buddhism, the teacher of the world, awakened for the sake of all humanity, awakened to the truth that no one had met with before this way out of suffering. And in the Buddhist time, there were many seeking the way out of suffering, many individuals practicing samadhi, this quality of collectedness, of peace of mind. And they gathered their minds in samadhi to the point of absorbing in jhana, these deep states of concentration. And this is a very high level of samadhi. And there were ascetics who practiced like this, attained this very high happiness of jhana. And this is where the mind is able to control all the moods and sense impressions. And the mind's no longer interested in the sense impressions of the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, or the mind. Even these nama qualities, these mental qualities, of perception and memory, feeling, mental formations and consciousness. Because this samadhi is so deep, so subtle. And yet even at that point, the mind is not yet free. And so the fully self-awakened Buddha had this incredible wisdom, this very deep wisdom. And to have this such deep wisdom means that He built a great amount of parami already in order to know for himself, to know without having a teacher. And so for ourselves, we see that this quality of dukkha, how is it? This quality of feeling ill at ease in the body, ill at ease in the mind, getting what one doesn't want, not getting what one does want, separating from the loved, these five aggregates of clinging, all the cause of suffering. We can also say suffering is birth, old age, sickness, and death. And having died, then we must circle around again and be born again according to the energy of merit and demerit, which bears fruit according to their respective uh, karma of merit and demerit. We see that if one has samadhi to the level of jhana, one uh, can be a brahma deity. But even when this jhana energy declines and goes away, then one is born again. But if one has the energy of jhana to the level of a brahma deity, then after death one can be born as a human, not going down to the lower realms. So therefore, for ourselves, we have this opportunity to study and learn the Dhamma. If we really set our hearts on it and we practice and we're sincere, it's not beyond our ability to understand and see. Because the Dhamma, the qualities to succeed in the Dhamma, the Buddha has taught already. She called the four bases of success, the Idi Pada which are chanda, virya, jitta, and vimangsa, these four qualities. And so the first of chanda is this quality of liking or enjoying setting our hearts on something. So that means we have chanda in that activity. For example, studying, learning, we really set our hearts to learn that subject because we like learning that. We investigate into it, we study it until we're skilled at it. So we have this effort to study and then it's not hard to succeed. Or if we're doing work and we like and enjoy that work, then we do it. We have striving and effort and then we can succeed in that work well. So in terms of Dhamma, this, these bases of success They're dhammas that lead to seeing and knowing the dhamma. 
So it's normal that we have this firm intent, we strive, we enjoy the Dhamma practice, for instance, practicing generosity, chanting, morality, meditation, and then we do it evenly, continuously. And then we look at and observe our minds. And so we also have these five faculties, the indriya, and there are qualities that are very important in our practice. They help us to set our hearts to do merit and build parami. For instance, doing generosity, making merit. And sometimes we might feel disheartened or not feeling up for doing these things. Our faith reduces. For instance, we don't want to chant. And if we become separated from this chanting for a long time, then our effort decreases as well. And the kilesas increase, the defilements get more. And the desire or intent to chant that we used to have gets less and less. And this faith and belief in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, if it hasn't yet reached a stable point, then it's capable of degenerating. So we observe, we have mindfulness to look at our mind right now and see what the state of mind is, how we're feeling. If we don't want to chant, or we don't want to practice samadhi, then our mind has no collectedness, has no samadhi, it just has busyness and lacks energy. And this is the energy of merit, it decreases the goodness and energy of wholesomeness in the mind lessens. And the energy to do more merit decreases. The energy to study Dhamma decreases. So if this happens, we should know that this happens and know that we have to recover ourselves and come back. Not to follow these feelings, but to know that we have to recover and bring ourselves up again. And to recover ourselves from this situation is to go against the stream of the world, to go against the current of greed, aversion, and delusion. So we have to go against this flow, to go against this flow of the world. Because we see that when water has a current, it flows from high to low. And if we follow this current of the water, it's very easy to do. If we put a boat in the water and we follow the current, it's not hard. But if we use that boat to go against the current, then this is harder. So in terms of beings in the world, almost all of them follow the flow, the flow of the world, which is the flow of moods, the flow of greed, the flow of aversion, the flow of delusion the flow of liking and disliking. This is the stream of the world, which is the cause for suffering to arise. And when we follow this stream of the world, we're not able to free ourselves from suffering. So this quality of effort, setting the heart, persevering, is very important. The Buddha taught that we realize freedom from suffering through the quality of effort. So we have this quality of chanda, of liking what we're doing, and we set our hearts well, we like to do it, we like this dhamma practice, and then we have effort. This effort means that if we're lazy, then we do it. If we're diligent, then we do it. We practice giving alms, practice generosity, practice chanting, practice virtue, we set our hearts on these practices. In this way, we're able to recover our minds, recover ourselves, and we can practice a lot, practice to train the mind to go against the stream of the world in order to go with the stream of Dhamma. And going with the stream of Dhamma, we can reach the point where the mind no longer wavers. This is the achara sata, the faith that is unwavering. So we have mindfulness 
to recollect and contemplate the Dhamma, that in the present, what feelings do we have? So we have mindfulness to watch over the mind. Does the mind have greed right now, or aversion, or delusion? And if so, what is the cause for those kilesas to be arising? And if there's no greed, no aversion, no delusion, why are they absent? If the mind is sad, then why is that? If the mind is bright, then why is that? If the mind is busy or collected in samadhi, then why is that? So we investigate and study this matter, investigate our minds. We really apply ourselves to this, to this practice of merit. Because thinking that our life might be long, this is uncertain, it's not sure. So in a given day, whether we do a lot or a little bit of merit, that's the food for our hearts. In terms of outer food, we have enough to sustain our lives. We have food, have shelter, have medicine, and the requisites, and so on. But this food for the heart is, is important. This food for the heart makes the mind fresh, makes the mind have merit and wholesomeness, which makes the mind uh, bright and rejuvenated. It's like a tree that has bright, thick green leaves. We look at it and we feel fresh. But if the tree has no leaves, then it feels dry. It's just like our minds. If the faith decreases, the effort decreases, the mind starts to feel dry, lacking freshness, lacking joy, lacking brightness. And sometimes the body feels weak, feels sore and painful, feels tired. And if this is the case, then we have to fight even more, really pour our hearts into it, to go against the stream of our moods, to against against the stream of the world, in order to realize the stream of the Dhamma. So if we're lazy, then we don't follow that laziness. In the beginning, we have to force our mind, force the mind to chant, to walk and sit meditation, and so sometimes we do it like this, and then we control the mind or force it, and we do it, these chanting, walking, and sitting meditation, we do it a lot, cultivate it a lot, in order to practice and train our minds. We pour our minds into it, and we have the quality of vimangsa, which is a quality of wisdom, the rising of wisdom in the mind. It's something that's of great value. And so we set our hearts on this and we sacrifice uh, external pleasures to make the mind seek out a pleasure which is stable, lasting, a uh, pleasure that, and happiness that doesn't fade, which is the happiness of Nibbana. So this is something that the Buddha knew for himself already, awakened to already. And the Buddha had the great loving kindness and compassion to teach the way to realize this lasting happiness, this way which is setting the heart, having effort and perseverance, really applying the mind with effort to investigate into the Dhamma, to seek out a cause in result, to understand cause and result in terms of the Buddha that the Dhamma, or the Dhamma that the Buddha taught, to see that the body is not me, not mine, not self. And we may know this according to memory, but true wisdom has yet to arise. When the mindfulness, wisdom, and samadhi are firm, then we can see it sometimes for ourselves. See that the body is something that we can't control. It just follows its own nature. These five aggregates are not under our power. They're unstable, impermanent, and uncertain. They're not within our control. And since they're not in our control, and they're impermanent and unstable and uncertain, 
And are they truly ours? Do they really belong to us? And if samadhi isn't firm, there's no wisdom, no samadhi, then the mind clings to it as self. This is a cause for suffering. And cessation doesn't arise. We can't let go. So therefore we strive, we practice, have effort and perseverance. We don't give up. We have patient endurance. And in the end, the mind can gather in samadhi. Wisdom can arise bit by bit. So we practice to contemplate all the time that these lives of ours are something uncertain, unsure. We practice not to be heedless in our lives. This is something that the Buddha warned us about, not to be heedless. So we set our hearts not to be heedless, to follow the teachings of the Buddha. And we can realize this in not no long time. We have to patiently endure first, and then we realize the fruits according to our effort. So we see everything as impermanent. We understand this Dhamma clearly. So this is something we strive to realize. And when we see this for ourselves, the energy in the mind increases. And then at this point, no one has to tell us what to do or warn us anymore. But our own mindfulness and wisdom uh, stirs up our own efforts of its own accord. Our own mindfulness and wisdom awakens us to sit and walk and chant. This is something that the great teachers have taught, that a practitioner who has uh, Vimangsa really sets their heart on the practice, and the practice becomes even and balanced. Even if, if one has a very strong illness, one is very sick, even then one doesn't give up, one still has effort to wake up at 4 a.m., to practice every single day. And this gives the mind energy and strength. For instance, some lay people wake up early every morning to make rice and prepare food to give alms. And they do this every day. So this is having effort. And so in terms of practice and meditation, we have effort as well. We set certain times of the day for meditation. That this is a time to do formal practice, to meditate. We don't just let go of our daily schedule and just let our time become wasted. But we have vimangsa, this wisdom quality, which is part of the four bases of success. And we have the five faculties, that which is of primary importance. We have this faith firmly established of effort and perseverance. We have the quality of wisdom, which is, we can also call mindfulness and clear comprehension. And this is part of Vimangsa as well. And this quality of jitta, another one of the four bases of success, One needs mindfulness and clear comprehension for that as well. And then we have effort, effort to arouse wholesome states, to increase wholesome states already arisen, to abandon unwholesome states that have arisen, and to avoid unwholesome states. And then we have the four, or sorry, the five powers five faculties, the four bases of success. We have the seven factors for awakening, the Noble Eightfold Path, and all the 37 wings to awakening all gather together. If we, separ- if we want to separate them out, then we can separate them out into these different qualities. But in terms of our practice, these four bases of success, these qualities to see the Dhamma, are just right here in our hearts. When we see this, then we don't doubt about our Dhamma practice. We observe this for ourselves. If the mind is weak and the five faculties are weak, 
then the mind can become uh, busy and distracted sometimes. Doubts arise, liking arises, disliking can arise all the time. We don't want to meditate. So this is a hindrance. This is one of the five hindrances, that which covers over the mind. So we need to have effort to abandon that which is unwholesome, to do that which is meritorious. And to see and know this, whether it's easy or difficult, it's up to the five faculties in our minds. We can also say it's up to our previously cultivated parami, our previously cultivated spiritual virtues, whether in the past or the present. If in the past we've only cultivated a little bit of parami, then if we do a lot in the present, then we can see the Dhamma all the same. This is something that Lumpu Cha taught, that if you've only done a little parami in the past, then do a lot in the present, follow the teachings of the great teacher, then you can see the Dhamma as well. You have to fight against the flow of the world in order to enter the flow of the Dhamma. This is something that's not beyond our capability, not beyond our capacity for effort. The Buddha entered final Nibbana already 2,565 years ago. He abandoned the five aggregates, let go of the five aggregates. But this pure mind, the pure mind of the Buddha is still here. The Buddha can arise in our, in our own hearts. If we practice following his teachings, we can realize this freedom for ourselves. So may you set your hearts on this to understand it clearly. To think that the Buddha is gone, the Buddha isn't here, is incorrect. The Buddha is still here. And how is the Buddha still here? Because the Buddha is in the Dhamma. Whoever sees the Dhamma sees the Tathagata. Even if we hold on to the very robe that the Buddha is wearing, we don't yet see the Buddha, we just see his physical form that the Buddha used for the benefit of all beings, in order to help all beings. But if we see impermanent suffering and not-self, no matter where we are, no matter when, what time we're alive in, in history, whatever country we're in, whatever place, we see the Buddha in our own hearts. So we see in this way that the Buddha is still here. We see the Buddha for sure in our own hearts. There's no doubt left. Faith arises. This is going against the flow of the world, using the four bases of success, striving to see the Dhamma, having effort, having this firm intent, It's something that's not beyond our capacity. So may you do this a lot in the present. Practice generosity, virtue, and meditation. In the end, you go against the flow of the world and can enter the flow of the Dhamma. And similarly with study in school or in work, if you set your heart on it, you can succeed as well. And... In the same way, you can succeed in seeing and knowing the Dhamma. So may you all set your hearts on this.